Thank you, thank you. Uh, Honorable Chair, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Galland, distinguished uh, panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege and a duty for South Africa to be part of this uh, event. A privilege because it gives us an opportunity to give back to the world what it sacrificed for South African people in order for them to accomplish and realize the right to self-determination. It is a duty because South Africans have lived through colonialism and uh, oppression. Not so long ago, I, I, I was in the trenches with Namibian women, women from Polisario, and women from other liberation movements, sharing the stage with them to rally the world in support of the cause of self-determination. So I sit here looking somewhat polished, like Ambassador Da Silva, but I'm in every shape and sense a product of this struggle for self-determination, because where this is not enjoyed, the consequences are felt harshest by women, by children, and by young uh, the youth. So it's a great privilege for me to be here today. We are uh, focusing on the declaration uh, on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples, which is known by its short title as Resolution 1514, which was adopted by the General Assembly on the 14th of December in 1960. The adoption of this resolution would not have been possible in the absence of a working majority that emerged gradually between 1955 and 1960 in favor of an anti-colonial measure, and in fact was in itself propelled as more countries were becoming free to realize their right to self-determination. This majority coalition would become known as the Non-Aligned Movement, and it was this formation that provided the intellectual cohesiveness and political tactical competence that ensured that we got Resolution 1514. The persuasiveness of Resolution 1514 lies in the fact that it interprets the Charter of the United Nations in such a manner that it amplifies and even extends the Charter's imperatives to include the struggle of people subjected to colonialism and their desire for self-determination and full sovereignty in the community and nation, of nations. In its substantive law stipulations, the Declaration <coughs> makes four important points that together serve as ordering principles of international law. Article 1 states that, I quote, the subjection of peoples to alien subjugation, subjugation, domination, and exploitation constitutes a denial of fundamental human rights. Article 2 states that all peoples have the right to self-determination and that necessarily it includes the right freely to determine their political status and freely to pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Article 4 states that all armed action or repressive measures of all kinds directed against dependent peoples shall cease. And Article 5 states that immediate steps shall be taken in the United Nations Trust and non-self-governing territories or all other territories which have not yet attained independence to transfer all powers to the people of those ter territories, close quotes. We need to be clear that the manner in which this declaration has informed the work of the General Assembly and the International Court of Justice has made it a peremptory norm in international law and hence binding on the UN as a whole. The declaration informed, among others, the 1971 advisory opinion of the ICJ on the continued presence of South Africa in Namibia, the 1975 advisory opinion on Western Sahara, and the 1986 ruling on military and paramilitary support being provided at the time to, to forces seeking to overthrow the elected government of Nicaragua. Chairperson, the declaration is of particular importance to my own country because it informed three resolutions of the General Assembly that provided the South African liberation movements with safeguards in their efforts to end apartheid and bring about a free democratic and democratic South Africa. These were resolutions 42 159 
of the 7th of December 1987, Resolution 44 slash 29 of December 4, 1989, and Resolution 46 slash 51 of December 1991, all of which reaffirm the inalienable right to self-determination and independence of all people under colonial and racist regimes and other forms of alien domination and upholding the legitimacy of their struggle, in particular the struggle of national liberation movements. Against the background of the liberation struggle of, of, people, of the people of South Africa, it is for us a cause of deep concern that the call contained in the declaration or for the inalienable, inalienable right of all peoples to complete freedom uh, is continuously and flagrantly violated in the case of the people of Sarawu, with no end in sight to their subjugation, oppression, and collective suffering. The occupying power has entrenched itself by way of overt and covert means in an attempt to sabotage the struggle of the people of Sarawu for self-determination. The tragedy of our time is that these efforts are aided and abetted by the collaboration of other countries, by willful ignorance and the turning of a blind eye by those who should know better, and by, and by the unfortunate manipulation of multilateral bodies to detract from the struggle of the people of South Africa. Chairperson, South Africa is familiar with these, with this, with these strategies and tactics. Our liberation movements confronted them for, for decades in a protracted and difficult struggle to achieve our freedom. It may be of some value to, uh, to share some of the tactics uh, with you. At a multilateral level, uh, the occupying oppressor regime seeks to deflect attention away from the liberation struggle of the subjugated people in various forms, which include placing individuals in the bureaucracies to keep, to gain, keep the issue, preventing it gaining traction, and to dilute efforts to prioritize to prioritize it. This is accompanied by campaigns to be elected onto committees and special procedures so as to keep the cause of uh, the occupied people off the agenda and submerge it under a plethora of other issues. The occupying power also deploys supporters to disrupt efforts to raise the profile of the liberation struggle of the people concerned. At, bilater at a bilateral level, the occupying power cultivates relationships with sympathetic countries that are prompted to act as its proxy in opposing the liberation struggle. In many cases, those relationships are blatantly rent-seeking in nature, with multilateral corporations from the, from the sympathetic country extracting the natural resources from the non-self-governing territory and trading them, or by opportunistic use of so-called dollar diplomacy in the form of, 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 of soft loans uh, finances and other uh, uh, measures. It is, however, in the non-self-governing territory itself that the occupied in power institutionalizes the oppression and subjugation of the occupied people. In order to thoroughly delegitimize the liberation struggle, the territory is divided to ensure control, freedom of movement is proscribed. Surveillance of activities and freedom, uh, 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 freedom fighters is pervasive. Access to information is controlled. Law enforcement is as abusive as we saw in the video uh, that was made. Watching that video, it was as if I was back in Soweto again. And looking at the eyes of the woman, uh, it was as if I was looking at the eyes of African women, women under apartheid, pleading to the world for support to ensure that we end uh, apartheid. Uh, um, activities will range from heavy-handed uh, use of, uh, of force, detention without trial, torture, intimidation, and all of uh, 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 such, in the hope that this will destroy the collective will of the people fighting to end subjugation and attain the right to self-development. Uh, We've witnessed recently an alarming uh, development of an occupying power managing to get itself to be the vice chair of the committee of, uh, 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 on decolonization. 
it's rather like having a party government, being the vice chair of uh, the decolonization committee. I had to sit back and wonder what we could have expected had that happened. Which raises, I think for me, an important responsibility for us to keep watch, to follow what is happening in the committee, in the fourth committee. We must make it our business to understand what is happening in the in that committee, so that its work is is not a, a disrupted. However, we don't see this as ultimate victory in itself because right always triumphs. We believe that the people of Sarawu will will will, will a, 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 a triumph, notwithstanding the challenges that we face. Uh, with respect to the declaration. We're heartened by the interest shown by many states in the struggle, uh, to, in support of the struggle of the people of Sahara, and by their thoughtful comments at the Human Rights Com uh, Council in this regard. We welcome the interaction between the Geneva Support Group and the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Western Sahara, and look forward in anticipation to it bearing fruit. We welcome the renewal of the mandate of Minister by the Security Council on the 29th of April 2017 for another year. We are encouraged by the commitment of the Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, the new one, in his report on Western Sahara of the 10th of April 2017 to breathe new life into the process of ensuring self-determination for the Sahrawi people. And we look forward to collaborating with his new special envoy to give effect to the obligations of the international community to the Sahrawi people. In conclusion, uh, 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 Chair, South Africa remains firmly committed to the liberation struggle of the Sahrawi people and to the realization of their right to self-determination. We align ourselves unequivocally with a statement in the resolution in Resolution 15, uh, uh, 14, that the peoples of the world identically desire the end of colonialism in all its manifestations. This is our last outstanding homework as a global community, and it will be accomplished. And we continue to draw inspiration from the words of Nelson Mandela, which are poignant and relevant to the Sahrawi people today. And he said, I quote him, I knew as well as I knew anything that the oppressor must be liberated just as surely as the oppressed. A man who takes away another man's freedom is a prisoner of hatred. He is locked behind the bars of prejudice and narrow-mindedness. I am not truly free I'm taking, if I'm taking away someone else's freedom, just as surely as I'm not free when my freedom is taken away. The oppressed and the oppressed alike are robbed of their humanity. The occupying country cannot claim to be truly free, free while it continues to, op to oppress the people of Sahara. Let us therefore continue to work, Chairperson, in the spirit of the Declaration and reinforce our efforts to ensure that in a couple of years, my sister or my sisters from Saura will be sitting behind this platform, just like I am with Ambassador da Silva, representing their country within the United Nations, having accomplished their right to self-determination. I thank you. Thank you.